He warned me. Once you've seen one, he said, you're going to be chasing eclipses too for the rest of your life. That was astronomer Bob Noya in 2016 at the Astronomical Society of Harrisburg. Some students and I were planning an epic field trip to Oregon to see the 2017 total eclipse. And the eclipse was a great draw. It was a, kind of a perfect once in a lifetime event to serve as the centerpiece of the trip's learning feast. But I have to admit, I was mostly looking forward to other things. Being present when the kids saw the crystalline desert sky at night. Watching their faces when they first saw Crater Lake's deep blue water. Stretching to hold hands around a redwood tree. Helping kids dig for real fossils in real cliffs. I didn't really believe the eclipse would be all that special. I wasn't expecting a deeply emotional, spiritual experience. There are solar eclipses and there are lunar eclipses. Lunar eclipses are cool enough. That's when the moon is in the shadow of the Earth. But on April 8th, just a few weeks from today, there will be a total solar eclipse when a small part of the Earth is in the shadow of the moon. And that's a different thing altogether from a lunar eclipse. It's a once-in-a-lifetime event. It seems like we should have a lunar eclipse every time the moon is full, right? And a solar eclipse when it's new. But the moon's orbit around Earth is tilted relative to the, the, um, relative to the sun, re relative to the Earth's orbit around the sun. So I don't know if you can see on the screen. Are we? Yes. There's a thin blue line that goes from the sun to the Earth, and that's called the ecliptic. Um, but you can see because of the tilt of the Earth's, the Moon's orbit, um, the shadows miss much of the time. It's hard to explain this in two dimensions. So pretend that my head is the Sun, right? And we're going to take the tilt of the Moon's orbit, and we're going to fast forward three months. So now your head is the Earth, mine is the Sun, and the Moon is going around your head like this. And you can see that here and here, Sometimes it's directly between the Earth and the Sun. I think I may have missed a slide. There we go. Um, but when they're in that configuration, there can be eclipses, but only if the Moon is at that precise intersection at exactly the right time, directly on the line between them. Here's a video of NASA, a NASA video of the moon's shadow crossing South America in 2020. And had you been there in that part of South America, you would have seen a total solar eclipse. I'm going to let it run twice so you can really see it. So first, the Earth is turning into the daytime, and then you see the shadow. So, I went to Oregon with my students for a total solar eclipse. And here it is seven years later, and I still don't know how to describe it. But I'm going to try one more time. There was a feeling of anticipation as the, moon's, the moon first made contact with the sun's disk, and then slowly began devouring it. It was slow, but it was fun to watch. In the dappled shade of trees were hundreds of crescent suns, the spaces between the leaves acting like living pinholes. We also brought a sheet of aluminum to demonstrate that same effect, and colanders work great too. Gradually, the light around us dimmed, and the whole world began to look thin, kind of papery, two-dimensional. It was almost like the opposite of an M.C. Escher drawing. Instead of a flat drawing appearing to have some depth, here was the real world's fullness appearing to flatten in a kind of unnerving way. And then it was dark. Not not dark like midnight, the horizon still looked like early dawn, but not just in the east, in every direction all around us. Stars twinkled clearly overhead, and, and Mars and Venus were visible near the ghostly hole where the sun had been just a little while before. We could see Bailey's beads, these colorful dots of light around the rim, where the mountains and craters of the moon define its silhouette. As soon as we were in totality, a handful of panicked birds flew silently across the campground where we were staying. 
And the literal star of the show revealed these angel wings of wispy gray streaming out from the ominous black disk where the sun should have been and was just moments before. We remembered that during totality, we can safely take off our eclipse glasses and watch with our bare eyes. So we did that, and I became intensely aware that that misty light I was seeing from the sun's corona traced this laser straight line of connection from my eye up through the atmosphere, just skimming the edge of the moon and then all the way out to the sun, in a way drawing me into their primordial dance, a dance that marries movement with stillness, light with shadow, and connects descendants with ancestors. But these weren't thoughts in my head. I kind of felt all of that all at once. It was, it was overwhelming. It was breathtaking. It was beautiful. And then it was over. Two minutes is a painfully short time. Far too soon, a sliver of sunlight ushered me back to Earth, to daytime in the Oregon desert. I exhaled and my breath caught. It became a sob of joy and awe. Awe. Awe is a word that used to mean something like stop you in your tracks, see the face of God, jaw-dropping, eye-popping, breathtaking, earth-shatteringly too wonderful to describe. That describes a total eclipse of the sun. It is awesome in the original sense of that word. Why? What, what is so special about seeing the moon block the sun? I don't really know. I can't explain it. I have three thoughts about it, though. First, an eclipse shakes up our worldview. The sun rises, it crosses the sky, and it sets every day. It just does. And we know that. We depend on it. We presume it. And then one day, weirdly, frighteningly, it just goes dark for a while. You know, our ancestors who thought eclipses were foreboding portents of doom, they weren't just being foolish. The experience of totality is wildly unsettling, even when we know exactly what's happening and why, and we know for sure that everything's going to be all right. My second thought about this is that an eclipse connects us in an intimate, visceral way with the heavens. This is the essence of my work in science and spirituality, except that a book or a sermon, a lecture, all of that has to get you there by way of the intellect, words, describing what science has found, teasing out the aspects that invoke awe, and then striving to forge some visceral connection with them. And then maybe, maybe experiencing the spirituality of knowing that you're part of it all. An eclipse is a direct, immersive experience. It's a laser shot from the heavens straight to your soul until you're left gasping for breath and begging for more. It's unsettling and joyous both, somehow. My third thought is that there's a lot of new research about this experience we call awe. Uh, events like eclipses with the combination of being unfamiliar and large scale can invoke what all researchers refer to as the small pro-social self. Awe eclipses our egos, and it takes us into a state of being where we feel the deep humility of our smallness, combined with a sense of interbeing with all existence. We also become highly prone to feeling connected with others nearby and to generosity. So awe makes us better people. A total solar eclipse is an embodied experience of the interdependent web of existence, our seventh principle. And under the proposed Article 2 of the, the new proposed UUA bylaws, interdependence is one of the six expressions of love. And eclipses are also deeply transformative, not only for the individuals who experience them, but historically they have been too, like in the reading that Craig made. I mean, you know, this takes us back to 
thousands of years before now. The feelings that eclipses evoke have sparked religiously creative responses in people since the dawn of human language. So in Chinese legends, the sun is swallowed by a dragon. Of course, it's a dragon, right? And to scare the dragon into spitting the sun back out, they would make a lot of noise. They'd bang on pots and pans and that sort of thing. And of course, it always worked, right? Actually, what we know about eclipses comes from, a lot of what we know comes from meticulous Chinese records kept going back 4,000 years. In India, they say a demon named Rahu disguised himself and slipped into a banquet of the gods. And Vishnu caught him and cut off his head just as Rahu had eaten but not yet swallowed some of the food of immortality. So they say an eclipse is Rahu's immortal head forever chasing the sun and sometimes catching and eating it. But of course, because Rahu has no neck, the sun reappears when he swallows it. Some West African peoples believe that when humans let their anger and fighting get out of hand, the sun and the moon begin to fight too, and that causes eclipses. And in that culture, the job of humans is to teach peace to the sun and the moon by ending their own human conflicts, reconciling with old enemies, and making amends. That's my favorite. Eclipses are fertile ground for symbolic interpretation, even for us in our culture and time. Whatever you believe about astrology, the moon's physical influence on us through tidal forces and um, the weird correlation with menstrual cycles and baby turtle hatchlings, it's profound, the moon's influence on us. It's a powerful force here on Earth. And the moon figures large in, art and, in art, art and literature for a reason, because it taps into primordial archetypes in all cultures, with symbology related to dark, to night, secrecy, cycles, femininity, time and eternity, companionship, mystery, and shadows, the shadow side of life. Well, during a total solar eclipse, you find yourself literally in the shadow of the moon, symbolically in the shadow of the shadow. Solar eclipses only happen during the new phase of the moon, which pagans associate with new beginnings, rebirth, and opportunities for being courageous. Metaphorically, then, an eclipse is the joining of the masculine and the feminine, or, if you wish, the feminine covering masculine. Speaking of masculine and feminine, that trip in 2017 put all of that symbology into a blender for my marriage. Anne and I had both been excited about being in the path of totality long before the eclipse was due to happen. But Anne's school year started earlier than mine, so the timing was close. The eclipse was on August, I think, 21st. We thought we would go south together to see the eclipse in North Carolina and then hightail it back for her first day at work. But then my students got excited about the eclipse and began planning and fundraising for a trip, and lots of constraints and considerations came into play, including the choice of the Oregon desert. <clears throat> and pushed back, not wanting a school trip <clears throat> to jeopardize our plans, to eclipse our plans as a couple. So I invited her to come along as another adult chaperone, but the timing simply didn't work. And before I knew it, I was deep into the planning of the school trip, too deep to back out. In the end, the school's eclipse trip eclipsed our plans to see the eclipse together. And funny as that sounds, Anne was pretty disappointed. Still, she participated as fully as she could. She walked around the streets of Harrisburg, <clears throat> loaning people her eclipse glasses so they could see the crescent sun. She pointed out the crescent sun is projected on the ground by trees. And it was clear she had fun with this. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it wasn't the same, and we weren't together as a couple. Okay, I admit, a geeky couple. <clears throat> 
but romantic too sometimes. Suffice it to say that this year, this time, <clears throat> we will be together for the eclipse. Now, many people have pointed out how peculiar it is that the distances to the moon and sun are precisely the same ratio as their diameters, so that the relatively tiny moon is just about exactly the same size in the sky as the unimaginably colossal sun, right? We know they're different sizes, but the distances come in too. Just right to perfectly cover it, exactly revealing the sun's corona, no more and no less. And in 2017, I thought that was a pretty amazing coincidence. But then this past October's annular eclipse reminded me that the moon's distance from the Earth varies. And when it's at a farther point in its orbit, it looks smaller. And so it only covers the middle of the sun, leaving a bright ring, often called a ring of fire eclipse. Still, the perfect geometry is part of the appeal of a total solar eclipse. It adds some magic to the experience. A note about safety. You need eclipse glasses if you want to look directly at the sun. And I have some you can buy after the service today if you'd like. If you get them elsewhere, make sure that they are ISO certified safe. There are a lot of fakes for sale online. There are a lot of places are running out of stock. So there's incentive for them to sell fakes. Be especially careful with children that day because as the eclipse happens, even here in York, the sun is gonna dim enough so that it won't be painful to look at, but it can still damage your eyesight. It's also safe to use pinhole methods, as shown here. And I can show you more about that after, if you'd like. In 2017, there was a bit of a ruckus on the far side of the campground where we were staying. Someone had looked at the sun with their binoculars, wearing eclipse glasses on her face. The eclipse glasses burst into flame on her face while she was wearing them, and she spent the eclipse in the ER. You have to cover the front lenses of any binocular or telescope that you're using before it goes through the instrument. During the brief minutes of totality, if you're in the path of totality, you can safely remove your eclipse glasses because the sun is completely blocked by the moon, including the harmful ultraviolet rays. Which reminds me, don't forget sunscreen on the rest of your skin, especially your face, because you're going to be facing straight at the sun much of that afternoon. Total solar eclipses are rare. When they happen, the moon's shadow traces a narrow path across the surface of the Earth. The last time the path, to, path of totality passed over York, was July 29 in 1478. The next time it passes over this spot will be in the year 2200, 176 years from now. And whoever's here, they're only going to get 12 seconds of totality in 2200. And on April 8th, just five weeks from now, the path of totality will come within a few hours' drive of here. If you're in that path, you experience totality. If you're not, you don't. Don't miss it. Make arrangements today, this afternoon. You may already be too late for hotel and motel reservations. So get on this if you'd like to go. There will be other total eclipses in the next few years in places like Greenland and Siberia and Australia, the middle of the Pacific Ocean, places that are a whole lot less convenient than Cleveland, Erie, or Buffalo, right? <clears throat> Your next chance to see a total eclipse of the sun in the contiguous 48 states is in 20 years, and that one is mostly in Canada with the moon's shadow just grazing one little corner of Montana, so a lot farther than Erie. Uh, in your planning, don't expect to drive very far on April 8th if you're going towards the path of totality. The roads near that path are just going to be totally jammed. So travel the day before and the day after. Remember, though, if it is cloudy, <clears throat> we might see nothing. It's a gamble, but it's worth taking. It's a gamble worth making.
Being in the path of totality for a total solar eclipse was one of the most deeply spiritual experiences of my life. I wish I could share it with you directly, but I can't. You just have to get there yourself somehow. This is truly a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to participate in one of the most engaging and connective astronomical dramas known to humanity. He warned me, and now I'm warning you. You're going to want to do it again. If you simply cannot travel to see the total eclipse on the 8th, you can still see a partial one, a really good partial one, from here in York. Here, the sun will be more than 90% covered. I think it's about 92.5% covered. So daylight is going to dim noticeably. If you have eclipse glasses or a pinhole camera, you can watch that happening. It'll be pretty cool. So free up the afternoon of April 8th on your calendar. And if it's clear, get outside to watch the sun get eaten by a dragon or a demon, or better yet, to watch the sun and the moon make peace. May we take... Oh, I'm way behind. <laughs> okay, this is where we'll end. May we take all opportunities ourselves to watch the sun and moon make peace and to make peace amongst one another. May it be so. And now, if you will rise in body or spirit and join us in singing one of my favorites, maybe yours too, Peter Mayer's Blue Boat Home.